52 hours after launching their offensive, the U.S. Marines gathered amid the burning oil fields outside Kuwait City. They had defeated its Iraqi defenders with fewer casualties than anyone had dared hope. But to the north, the battle to destroy Iraq's Republican Guard was still raging. Destroyed Iraqi tanks lined the road into Kuwait City. The Marine commander had feared thousands of his troops would die. 28 had, but now the city was his. We had made arrangements for the Arab coalition forces to go into the city. And I was sitting there getting a little restless and wondering, okay, what are we going to do? I'm tired of sitting here, so... So we drove into the city. And the outpouring was something I'll never forget. What they were saying was, God bless you, America, God bless you. you know, we love you. Very... Uh, very emotional moment for us after all of this. Saddam Hussein had expected a bloody stalemate on the battlefield that would undermine the coalition's resolve. Now he was fighting to survive. The Allies wanted to destroy his retreating army, above all its elite Republican Guard divisions, and break Iraq as a military power. His regime was judged unlikely to survive such humiliation. He sat in front of me and he was almost in tears, not crying, but almost in tears. He said, we do not know what God will bring upon us tomorrow. He was virtually collapsing. He had reached the depths. Kuwait City was free, but the most intense fighting of the war was about to begin. While the British rounded up the army in the south, the American tanks were chasing Iraq's best troops, the Republican Guard. Except for a rear guard, they were retreating, but the Americans were determined to destroy them. We never once said to anybody, your mission is going to be complete as soon as we kick the Iraqis out of Kuwait. That was not what we told our forces. We said to our forces that we wanted to close with and destroy the Republican guards. The Iraqi rear guard prepared for battle. As the Americans advanced, scores of tanks from the Republican guards Medina division were dug in along a low ridge. The defensive line stretched for six miles. What happened next became known as the Battle of Medina Ridge. I know there's enemy out there, but I don't know where the heck they're at. And then, boom, we were in it. I look up, and it was about 3,700 meters away, and there's BMPs and T-72s sitting on the ridge. Old brigade online, within three seconds, had let loose with their first rounds. Moving about 20, 25 miles an hour, like a cavalry charge towards the Iraqi emplacements. And all you could see every time we shot was a massive explosion. The Iraqi tanks only had a range of one mile, around half that of the American tanks. The turrets were flipping 40, 50 feet in the air. 11 tons of steel just, it was incredible to see a gun tube and the turret just spinning up in the air and landing hundreds of yards away from the vehicles. We took prisoners, very few, at Medina Ridge. Very few. I saw three. 
in, in the desert you could see for miles. Most people I saw were dead. Later on in the battle, when I rolled up there, there was pieces everywhere. I have never seen such destruction in my life. I was just shocked that people can do so much devastation in such a short period of time. In all, 300 Iraqi tanks and armored vehicles, together with their crews, were destroyed along the six-mile front. One American was killed. Nothing stood between the retreating Republican Guard and destruction. A radio message told Saddam Hussein of the defeat. Saddam thought his downfall was imminent. He asked me, do you think the Allies will come as far as Baghdad? He was quite desperate and frightened. With the rear guard destroyed, Schwarzkopf sent American tanks driving for the sea. Meanwhile, more tanks and airborne forces raced to close the trap on the Iraqi troops. Sixty helicopters from the American 101st Airborne Division leapfrogged a hundred miles deep into the Iraqi desert. Their mission was an ambitious one. The troops had orders to build an airbase from which Apache helicopter gunships could attack the Republican Guard until the American tanks closed in. Within two hours, the base was operational. Waves of Apache gunships arrived and refueled. Then they headed north to hunt the enemy. Doug Gabriel led one flight of four Apaches. We took off due north as fast as we could go, probably 30 feet off the ground, 120 knots. The terrain changed. We started flying over marshes. This is what Gabram could see through his gun camera. He found the Iraqis on a causeway across the marshes north of Kuwait. We saw people, dismounted infantry. I'd see the AK-47 raised with the white flag on it. Initially, I didn't fire. Um, my chalk two or three would say, hey, the guy's shooting at us. You know, they're shooting at us with white flags on the end of their barrels. And uh, my philosophy changed in that I'm not going to take any chances. So when I see troops, I'm, you know, I'm going to fire. I got people running on the road there. Now we count three airplanes. Where's the other one? Hundreds of soldiers were lying in the reeds along the edges of the causeway. As Gabram continued down the causeway, an American pilot who'd been shot down and was parachuting to the ground put out an emergency broadcast. The pilot landed safely. A rescue helicopter set off. Five of the eight crew would not survive. All afternoon, waves of gunships attacked the Iraqi troops. We're going to back away from them a little bit. Everybody seems to be no threat at all. Okay, 47. In the confusion of battle, no one could be sure how many units were retreating undetected. But the American forces intended to cut them off and trap them all in a ring of Allied tanks. We spent the whole journey on foot, walking among dead bodies. Dead soldiers were everywhere. The army's morale had collapsed. Seventy thousand had surrendered. The Americans no longer bothered to guard them. They just sent them to the rear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. To close the trap on the Iraqis, and particularly the Republican Guard, the fighting had to continue. But in Washington, America's most senior general wasn't...